Okay, okay, okay. Hello and welcome back to WKOZ Camp Cosmographia Radio. If you're just tuning in, this is Camp Director Nina and we're in the midst of a natural, well, no, a supernatural disaster. Ah, here is Groundskeeper Dan to explain while I get supplies together. Um, hello. This is a code orange, which usually just means some bad weather at camp. And to let our campers know it's autumn and time to turn their writing to darker material. We've seen winds so strong they've nearly uprooted trees. Usually a code orange is a good thing here at camp, if you think about it. Gets writers excited, motivated. Might help with those writer's blocks everyone seems to have lately. But this year we're facing something completely new. Witches. Groundskeeper Dan. Sorry to interrupt you, but do these flashlights have old batteries in them? They're not working. Strange. I just replaced them. Let me see. Huh. Those are the last ones. Never used, though. I don't know what to do. We can't go out there without some kind of light. What about the lantern hanging by the door? That's been here since I can remember. I've never seen anybody use it. It's always just been on the wall. I thought it was rustic decor, like everything else in here. Ooh, hello, light. All right, we're good. Lantern, check. Autumn trail guides. I'm here. here. And last but certainly not least, Campers! Let's give them a round of applause. We have to go out in the dark night for a while, but we're going together and we have a light. You out there listening, you have a choice. Will you come to Autumn Camp? Because if this is a code orange, and I think it is, then the only way to save camp from this supernatural storm is well to craft the spookiest and most interesting autumn stories poems essays creative nonfiction, everything in between that we can who's with me what are we going to do out there you'll hear all about the upcoming workshops for autumn camp and see where they take place this will help us all prepare for a great day and if we do it right, we might be able to save camp. I'll stay behind. Need someone to keep the home fires burning. Right, right. Good idea. I'll grab my walkie. Contact me if anything strange happens. Couldn't get much stranger than this. No way am I going out there. You know, Bree, in the world outside of camp, a code orange means a lot of things. It, in a hospital, it means a bomb threat or a radioactive spill or a potentially violent person with mental issues roaming the halls. Is that supposed to make me feel better? It's also a certain air quality warning, uh, letting sensitive groups know to stay inside. You could stay behind at the lodge with Dan if you need to. Of course, we'd love to have you with us, but everyone has to honor their own level of sensitivity. Um, well, I don't know. You should all stick together. Nina probably needs all the help she can get. You'll be fine, right, Bree? I guess so. Now everyone stay close. Start thinking of your autumn writing. All this is just uh, mental energy, psychic wind. Gotta get it on the page and we will. 
Follow me. It's like the entire atmosphere at camp is different. Hmm. Atmosphere is everything, isn't it? It informs voice, tone, point of view. Uh, it's an underappreciated uh, tool to create tension and immersion in your writing. A gothic atmosphere is one of the most effective tools in your spooky season storytelling kit. I think I saw something. Uh, just stick close. We should be okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so if we had all the time in the world, my workshop would explore the pleasure of the strange, the other, the sublime, the sense of the beyond. After all, before I was Camp Director Nina, I was Halloween. And before I was Halloween, I was uh, Literary Theory Nina. Did people actually call you that? Hmm, well, no. Uh, I, I did study literary theory obsessively, though. Almost religiously. In my 20s. But, you know, then I got into the actual making of books as a writer and editor, and I've learned that writing atmosphere is something better done through the body than the intellect. So, we're not going to try to understand the gothic as a genre, because, uh, it isn't. There are gothic elements in horror, sci-fi, fantasy, fairy tales. The literary locales are uh, endless. The gothic is more about a setting, an aesthetic, a mood, a vibe. Mm. Nor are we going to analyze the concept of the abject, mm. the unhomely, or Chris Davis' marriage of pleasure and terror as the things that make up horror. Quote, one does not know it, one does not desire it, one joys in it. Un on juit. Sorry, grad school creeps it when I'm nervous. Finally, here we are. The field of vision. One of my favorite places at camp. Hey, we were just in here, looking for my writer's block. The My Story Woods, the Mystery Woods. All right. Anyway, we're not going in, not just yet. We're stopping right here, just outside the woods for now. See, my workshop is called That Haunted Region, Breathing Life and Death into a Gothic Scene. We're at that point in the storytelling where we are just beginning to establish an atmosphere. Wondering what may lay beyond. What we can currently see. But something we can maybe sense. That's why this place is called the Field of Vision. This time of year, she goes blonde and tan. The plants dry up and begin to die off, and the tall grasses sway around your knees. If we've grown pumpkins, which we did this year, she is full of twisty vines and beautiful round orange gourds, and the smells of both life and decay. It's a good place to start imagining. So, I know you can all see these woods that extend as far as the eye can see. In those dark woods are many things. In my workshop, you'll be riding on the edges of those things. You'll be setting up the atmosphere and the sense of what could be beyond. You'll try breathing life and death into your own immersive, haunted region at the edges of the rational. We're going to try to be a little unconventional, though. We're going to try to be a little more holistic in our approach. In my class, we'll use music, immersion, memory, 
lyricism. We're going to try to make each other shiver. But for right now, it's time to do a test. I am going to share a gothic scene I'm working on. One that promises lots of secrets and spookiness. It's the type that I like. Dusk. Autumn. A little witchiness. Voices in the air. A little early American gothic setting. Specifically America after the Revolutionary War. People making settlements on the edges of woods and hollows. Full of the unknown dangers both natural and supernatural. Christianity took on many strange forms where I grew up in the burnt over district of New York State. But so did the old world superstitions that still hung on. But first, can anyone find some words to describe the atmosphere right here, right now? It was a dark and stormy night. Ha! Ah, good one, Bree. No, but for real. The trees look menacing. Like their branches are particularly black against this strange, stormy, purple and blue sky. I keep thinking I see a figure at the edge of the trees. But I guess it could just be my imagination. Exactly. The key to the gothic atmosphere is the narrator or POV character whose mind may or may not be playing tricks on them. This allows the strange what-ifs to come to life in the imagination. Is it just about their senses? No, thoughts are very important too. Stories they've heard, legends, lore, long-forgotten memories, all suddenly coming back to mind. Okay, okay, enough! We get it! Here is something I am making up right now. Test one. Here we go. It was mid-autumn on Crooked Lake. In the years after the War of Revolution. Mary, who was the wife of a farmer and also much more, sat on her stoop and cut open a small red apple. She had much to do to prepare for the return of her husband and son from Jerusalem, the settlement at the foot of the lake. But for some reason, she could not bring herself to leave the front porch. She cut into her apple with a paring knife, one thin slice at a time. One by one, golden leaves started letting go of the high trees that protected the cottage. As the sun sank over the bluff, first the horizon lit up in ribbons of berry and honeysuckle, then it became an amorous red. But though the dusk was quite beautiful, Mary was not at ease. She could feel something, something in the woods turning its dark eye towards her, and she imagined that this time it would not just stay in the woods at the edges of the trees, but would find her at long last, approach along the horse path like any gentleman wearing a dark jacket and a tall hat. She had often heard tales of the dancing man so named for it was said that he appeared as the lover in a dancing embrace to carry you off, never to be seen or heard from again. She even had her own version of the story that she liked to tell by the fire, that the townspeople had dull eyes and unhappy hearts, which was because they were too close together and too close to the church from which a man of God was always peering 
telling them which way to break bread or court a sweetheart. And how those unhappy hearts called out without knowing it. They called out in desperation to the high hills that crowned their valley and cast long shadows over their lake. They called for something to come between them and their work-a-day world. And when they called, it listened. Mary. She seemed to hear a voice from the horse path, but it was no voice she knew. It was soft, like the voice of a forgotten lover. Or was it just the sound of the wind picking up and racing from the trees over the boundary of stone? It worked! Oh, oh, thank the gods of camp. Okay. Now this is just one scene. With a little bit of description and a little bit of letting our POV character's mind return to the lore and superstition that she knows, we aren't quite sure yet if we truly need to worry about what's out there because a gothic scene is amped up by the irrational imaginings of the POV character. Whether those imaginings are irrational, every story will answer in its own way. If you want to write your own gothic setting or scene, come to my Autumn Camp Workshop. Friends will talk about details, words, poetry. Listen to some music and look at some scenes and find our particular resonance where we want to play in the gothic and we'll be writing some of our own tingly stuff and speaking of unreliable narrators robin you're up it's gonna get dark in there i'm passing the lantern to you thanks nina first things first Writers in the process of character building or simply wanting to expand their knowledge are all welcome. But be warned, there are strange characters on the loose in this forest. Some of them are downright psycho. If you're too scared, you can turn back now. Go back to the lodge and get warm. No one will judge you too much. Glad you stayed. Everyone, please follow me. Stay close behind, for the night is dark and full of terrors. Picking up where Nina left off, when I was carving out this trail, I wrote letters to my lover from behind asylum walls, a modern gothic tale in the form of missive poetry, and its main character, Sweet Jane, was what we call an unreliable narrator. So, Letters to My Lover tells the story of an institutionalized patient, Sweet Jane, through her letters to her lover on the outside. It forces you to unravel the truth behind Sweet Jane's letters over time, and it becomes sort of a puzzle. Is her telling of what came before the main plot true? Is she accurately describing what happened then and what's happening presently? And if not, is it because she's lying? Or is it because she's genuinely perceiving unreal events? If she's lying, why? To what end? Remember who she's talking to. If her sanity is in question, then what can be pieced together in order to define the real events? So even if we figure out, okay, this person might not be giving us the entire truth, whether it's a lie or whether it's through skewed perception, what's really happening? So now we have two stories we need to start to put together. In order to do this, you need to ask three questions. One, do we, the audience, know? Two, what do they, the unreliable narrator, know? And three, why does it matter? Did you see that? Okay, that's as far in as we'll go for now. If you want to take this trail walk with me, come back on October 14th at 12 p.m. Eastern, and we'll go much further in. 
You'll learn the history and archetypes behind these untrustworthy speakers. Then, you'll unearth some best practices for crafting compelling, mysterious, and more often than not mischievous narrators. Passing the lantern over to you, Fran. Let's keep moving. Thanks. I think I see where my trail starts. I'll try to get you through this as soon as possible. First, hi. I'm Fran Tepper, your autumn trail guide. You may remember me from the trail walk I gave over the summer on how I wrote my memoir, Fair Lady. But for the autumn camp, I'll be showing you part of the path I carved when writing my romance suspense novel, After the Enchantment. Here we are. Since October is a month for ghosts and ghoulies, I thought we would talk about writing a villainous character because every good murder mystery deserves a truly memorable bad guy. We're going to discuss how to slowly introduce your villain for maximum impact, and then we'll talk a little about finding inspiration for your creation. That sounds fun. It is, Camper Bree. Writing a villain is absolutely fun. It's much easier to make someone truly unlikable than it is to make someone the darling of your audience. So join me on October 14th at 1.30 p.m. for It's Good to Be Bad, designing a great villain, and let's make some good bad guys together. Thank you, Fran. Oh, this will be a big help. I can feel it. But for now, thanks for keeping it short and sweet. I'd like to get out of here. Do you guys see that? Back there in the trees? Trail guide Megan, get us out of these woods. On it. Folks, our radio transmission is ending for now, but part two is coming very soon, like in a matter of days. Subscribe so you don't miss it. We have three important events to prepare you for, and oh yes, we still have to save camp. All right, everyone out there listening, this is a code orange. I repeat, a code orange. But we have a plan to save camp, and you can be a part of it. On October 14th, 2023, come to Autumn Camp, a celebration of spooky season storytelling with online workshops from published authors and talented teachers. Spend the day with like-minded writers exploring villains, unreliable narrators, mining personal scary stories, atmospheric gothic settings, strategic storytelling. And at the end of the day, join us for a cozy live reading and performance from our favorite early American gothic stories and poems, including original songs by singer-songwriters Rebecca Joy, Daniel Danger, and Victor Alvarez written just for this occasion. Stop motion video art by trail guide Megan Greenbaum. And a live reading of Poe, Washington Irving, and more by your faithful trail guides and camp director. Come to as many or as few events as you want. All are free, though donations are greatly appreciated to support our teachers. Register at the website cosmographiabooks.com backslash camp dash cosmographia WKOZ Camp Cosmographia Radio is a production of Cosmographia Books. Today's story was written by Nina Alvarez and performed by Nina Alvarez, Daniel Hurd, Brianna Hayes, Robin Sinclair, Francis Tepper, and Megan Greenbaum. To learn more about camp, visit us on Instagram at WKOZ Camp Cosmographia Radio. This has been Camp Director Nina with WKOZ Camp Cosmographia Radio, signing off. <laughs> okay, thank you.